thank you for joining us on this SAG After live stream on YouTube. To stay informed about all of our live stream and video events, we invite you to subscribe to this channel. You can go ahead and do that right now. Today, in partnership with AAJA, we present Stop Asian Hate, journalists and actors on how the media can support the AAPI community. We'll be pausing throughout as we have with us Destiny Bradford and Richard Loya to translate the programming into American Sign Language. Destiny and Richard will be trading off periodically throughout today's events. The presentation will begin in just a moment, but before we do, if you have questions that you'd like to direct to today's guests, please submit those at pteoe at sagafter.org. That's pteoe at sagafter.org, and we'll do our best to get those questions in or answered. We'll be monitoring incoming questions and we'll ask them live on air as time permits. As a reminder, today's program is being recorded and you can watch the replay right here on sag -AFTRA's YouTube channel along with a lot more great content. We also invite you to follow the conversation on social media using our official hashtags, hashtag sag -AFTRA and hashtag stop the hate. Now, please give a warm welcome to today's host, sag -AFTRA president, Gabrielle Carteris. Thank you, Pam. Thank you so much. First, I want to thank the Asian American Journalists Association for its partnership of this important event. It's part of SAG-AFTRA's Stop the Hate Week, which we bring to our members as part of our regular intensive focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I know that many of us still cannot shake the images of the horrific violence that the Asian American community endured just a few weeks ago in Atlanta. Gun violence is an incredibly tragic reality of life in our country, but this particular gruesome act that took the lives of eight people, six of whom were Asian women, was clearly built on the hate and racism that permeates our country. Our Asian sisters and brothers have confronted racism and hate for decades, but that hate and racism has been especially inflamed in the past few years and been given extra fuel by political leaders who have targeted and singled out the Asian community on the back of the COVID-19 pandemic. SAG after members who are part of the Asian American Pacific Islander community experienced this on multiple levels. They experienced it as broadcasters. They've been covering the Atlanta murders and the broader Asian American bullying and violence. And oftentimes when they do their jobs, they too become part, tar become part targets. For Asian American Pacific Islander actors, discrimination is not a new phenomenon. Together, broadcasters and performers in our entire sag after community are taking up the urgent discussion and hopefully solution on how communities in the media can help stop the hate. We have a really impressive group of presenters and panelists today, but before I introduce our moderator, I just want to welcome our National Executive Director, David White, who is an incredible advocate. Hello, David. How are you? Hello, Madam President. I am great today and really pleased to be here. So I'm looking forward to a terrific conversation. So hello to all and thank you. Thank you. We're so glad that you're here. This is really, you have been a champion. All right. So now it is my great honor to turn this discussion over to sag afters National Vice President from Los Angeles, Clyde Kasatsu. Clyde has an incredibly long, distinguished film career spanning, what, half a century uh, appearing in scores of award-winning television series from Taxi, Lou Grant, MASH, all the way to NCIS and Designated Survivor. Clyde, I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you and welcome. Well, aloha and mahalo. Thank you, Gabrielle, for your moving remarks and keeping alive the memory of the Asian women who were murdered in Atlanta. And um, of course, <laughs> thank you for that lovely introduction. And as well, thank you for your strong leadership of SAG-AFTRA. You know, I've been in front of the camera or behind a mic for 48 years now after training as a theater major at Northwestern University when there weren't many who looked like me on the screen and on TV in those days, except for stereotype, stereotypes. In fact, my freshman year, I had a professor stop me in the hall and said, why do I want to be an actor? Because there's only T.S. of the August Moon and The King and I, and how could I possibly think of making the living? I mean, I was shocked and humiliated, but you know, sometimes that happens for purpose and it made me determined to be 10 times better than a white actor if that's what it took to get me there. And I did a lot of roles at Northwestern. In three years, I became a working member of that department playing character roles. And I learned that the audiences, if you were good, were accepting of 
you, no matter where you came from in your background. In, in LA, I joined East West Players in 72. For the purpose, one of the main purposes was to show the industry at the time that Asian actors could do more than just the laundryman or the houseboy. So we did Ibsen, we did Chekhov, and we also were able to give a ground for fledgling Asian American writers like David Henry Wong. But I want to give a pushback and say that we have to keep on working. And to do that, a lot of it depends upon the knowledge we bring. Like, for example, I used to push back that the oldest Asian presence in the United States goes back to the 18th century in a place called Barataria Bay outside of New Orleans, where there was a Filipino community called Little Manila. John Lafitte, the pirate in the 1800s, had a pirate fleet of three ships. Six to 700 of them were manned by Filipino sailors who jumped ship on the Spanish galleons. And in the War of 1812, they joined forces with Gen General, Gen uh, General Andrew Jackson to defeat the British at the Battle of New Orleans in 1814. And they're still there, the oldest. Anyway, growing up in Hawaii, I was very much aware of the prejudice and it wasn't fair, it wasn't right. But if I learned one thing, if you're gonna protest and, and bring some, advocate for change, you also better have examples how to do it. And that's the powerful role of SAG-AFTRA, is to build a vision of how to challenge and correct the bias and unite people under the union banner. And I, and I see unity now, and that is the silver lining of this all. Before it was anti-Japanese or anti-Chinese or anti-Vietnamese, but this time everyone has the face of the hate and prejudice against the AAPI. And we're rallying around AAPI. So I proudly identify with that and the fellowship and unity of the shared purpose. So now it's a great uh, pleasure to turn the stage over to Ren Hanami. She's the national chair of sag aftras Asian Pacific uh, American Media Committee. She's had uh, television career credits from ER to Grey's Anatomy and films like Air Force One. Air Force One. E mai, uh, Ren. Mahalo, Clyde. Thank you, Gabby and Clyde, for your incisive remarks and observations. As the national chair of sag aftras Asian Pacific American Media Committee, I'm grateful that our union has chosen this important time to elevate the urgency of a need to act, not just talk, about diversity, equity, and inclusion. To give some context to our discussion today, it's useful to sketch out the mission of sag aftras APAM committee. We advocate for the inclusion, authentic representation, and positive exposure in all forms of media and entertainment, and of course, fair employment of those who identify themselves as being Asian and Pacific Islander heritage which includes a broad spectrum of the union's members with origins in the Far East, Southeast Asia, or the Indian subcontinent. The scope of Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander includes Native Hawaiian, Samoan, Guamanian, or Chamorro, Fijian, Tongan, or Marshallese peoples, and encompasses the people within the United States jurisdictions of Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. As you can see, it's a beautiful mosaic of talented professionals who identify with communities far and wide across the globe. I think it's perhaps obvious that at this moment, our community has been deeply affected by the events taking place in society. With the recent horrific murders in Atlanta and the broader documented rise in violence against Asian Americans, which our community has been well aware of and is a direct result of the continued fanning of hatred by political figures that has only underscored the need for our work. Just to give you a flavor of the way APAM's work has helped sag after members, because of APAM's sponsorship and successful casting panels at the Hawaii International Film Festival, the committee was able to inspire and assist the University of Hawaii into putting all its student films under a sag after a student agreement. Other sponsored screenings and panels with community partners have uplifted filmmakers and content creators who are using sag after agreements and members exclusively, which in turn is motivating more filmmakers and content creators to do the same. 
APAM's partnership with AAJA and our Story Slams have helped numerous SAG-AFTRA broadcast members in telling their unique AAPIA stories and growing as journalists. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce our moderator, Myra Ansari, anchor and reporter at Wave 3 News, Louisville, Kentucky, who will lead us through a discussion with an incredible panel of amazing professionals. Myra. Thank you. I'm so honored to be a part of this wonderful event and be around such talented groups of people. I'm going to dive right in and introduce uh, the folks who are going to be on our panel today, starting with Juju Chang. There's an Emmy award-winning co-anchor of ABC's Nightline and an AAJA member. She has been outspoken in covering the recent violence against Asian Americans. She's recognized for her in-depth personal narratives set against the backdrop of presenting national and international news. We wanna welcome Juju Chang. Thank you for being here. Dion Lim is an Emmy award-winning anchor and reporter at ABC7 KGO-TV in San Francisco and author of Make Your Moment, the Savvy Women's Communication Playbook to Getting the Success You Want. You need to check that out. She has led the charge in shedding light on the hate and assaults targeting Asian Americans in the Bay Area. She is an AAJA member. Thank you, Dion Lim, for also joining us. Richard Louie will be joining us here in a little bit due to his schedule. He is a journalist and an anchor for MSNBC and NBC News and author of the book, Enough About Me, The Unexpected Power of Selflessness. While at CNN, Richard was the first Asian American to anchor a daily national news program and has furthered the conversation about Asian American hate in America by sharing his father's story Richard is also an AAJA member. Olivia Munn is an actor who has played journalist on HBO's The Newsroom and Comedy Central's The Daily Show with Jon Stewart and starred in films, The Predator, Deliver Us from Evil, and most recently, Violet. We are ever grateful for her strong advocacy against AAPI hate and Olivia was recently interviewed by Juju Chang. If you haven't seen it, you need to check it out in ABC's news report, Stop the Hate, The Rise in Violence Against Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. An Oklahoma native who majored in journalism, Mun spent the majority of her childhood in Tokyo and speaks fluent Japanese. Brian T is also with us. He's an actor best known for his role as Dr. Ethan Choi on Chicago Med, and we've seen him in blockbuster films, Fast and the Furious, Tokyo Drift, The Wolverine, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, which I'll say my children loved. Thank you. Brian is a mixture of multiple Asian descents, a Los Angeles native. He continues to live in LA with his wife, uh, Marilee. Hopefully I said that correct. And daughter Madeline Schuyler as a sag after member who has been extremely vocal and outspoken to stop AAPI hate. Thank you all for being with us today. I really appreciate it. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit first about self-awareness. Sometimes we need to check in with ourselves. You know, an NBC investigative reporter, Vicki Nguyen, admitted that before taping a segment of her Colleagues, one of her colleagues simply asked her, how are you doing? And uh, while checking in with herself, she felt overwhelmed and um, couldn't control her tears. Sometimes we all feel those emotions. Um, so I want to ask you all really quickly a check-in. How are you doing? Juju, you want to chime in? Um. I think that I have spent a lot of time compartmentalizing um, when I'm out covering stories. I was thinking about all of the mass shootings that I've covered from um, the Vegas shooting, the Orlando shooting, Newtown school shooting. Um, but when I was in Atlanta after the shooting at three Asian themed spas, um, I couldn't help but um, see myself reflected in the victims. Um, and when I interviewed Randy Park, one of the sons of the victims, I saw my son in his eyes. Um, so it, it's, it sort of um, brings up a, a cumulative grief and trauma 
that uh, I've been working through slowly because I do think it's important to sort of unpack all of the things that we are exposed to and process and reflect on. Um, but, but I have also been uplifted by so many of my friends and allies and colleagues, um, and they have sent me messages of, of care and concern. And when I see um, people like Olivia and Brian and others um, stand up and speak on our community's behalf, I also feel uplifted. So I, I'm, I'm good, thank you. That was a long answer, <laughs> sorry. No, it was a perfect answer. Olivia, how are you doing? Yeah, that was actually a, such a great answer, Judy, especially to hear it from your side, because I do think about uh, the journalists a lot. I mean, you got, I mean, as advocates um, and people who are using our platform, like Brian and I are, to, to get the message out and amplify it, you guys are actually out there having to talk to the people and, 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 and seeing the victims' families and watching bodies be taken out. And, um, you know, it's, it's so hard already for just people watching. And we, we know that already with people talking about how much on social media, there's just so much negative stuff and it's so hard to get away from it. But at the same time, we need to know it. I can only imagine how much harder it is for you guys out there having to report on it. It's, um, I know how exhausting it must be, but um, also to Juju's point, there has been this really great feeling of unification with um, our community. Um, and, and, and being able to get to know people like Dion and Juju and, um, and other people and like state representatives like B. Wynn in Atlanta, who um, I actually became friends with before the, the shootings in Atlanta. And so when that happened, it was really, it was a really special thing to be able to have each other to lean on and to talk to and, um, and to reach out and, um, and express like what we're feeling. And also that we have all really, unified to say like, okay, how can we support each other, but also how can we amplify and try to make a change? And that has been a really great feeling, even though it's a very scary time right now. And um, there's so much violence that's still happening against our community. Um, I do feel like there is a, there's a lot of hope that we're going in the right direction. I sometimes feel like it's two steps forward and then 10 steps back because there's just so much to cover. And Juju, to your point, mass shootings are one thing, right? We've covered them extensively, but this is just ongoing. And I woke up yesterday and I wasn't even working or supposed to be working. It was my off day. And I had gotten tipped off to this incident and it's triggering and it's horrific, but I said to myself, this is a chance now that people are paying attention, the world is watching and listening. So that gives me comfort to keep going. And like Vicki Wynn of NBC, I've broken down a number of times on TV, but I've come to a point where it's okay because no one has ever said it's not okay for you to feel this way. And I think breaking down that stigma has been so helpful because I was ashamed for a long time to show any emotion because we have been taught not to, just to report the news. But I think if you don't, then something's wrong. Then you're almost not human. I think it's perfectly acceptable these days. Thank you. Brian, tell us how you're doing. Um, I mean, just to reiterate what all these wonderful people have been saying. I, I too, like Olivia with Juju and Dion, I can't imagine what you guys have had to go through just reporting everything that's going on. Dion, I follow you and I see your feeds and it's heart wrenching every time you, you pop up. And so for myself, I, I do feel a sense of hope. I do feel this sense of community really truly coming together that I've never had in my entire career. Um, unfortunately, it took this much to make it all kind of come together. So there is that sense of, of hope that we can unify and kind of create progress that is genuine and that is real to the next generations that come behind us. Right. Thank you for all of those responses. You know, we just touched up on it already, but you know, it's been a, as a community who's been paying attention, we know that anti-Asian racism and bullying and hate crimes They've been going on uh, for a year and longer. Um, for our journalists here on the panel, at what point did these stories engage you? I know, Juju, you mentioned it. Um, and what perspective did you want to lend to it? Well, the numbers started creeping up 
pretty quickly after the rhetoric started heating up. Um, Stop AAPI hate was quite clear. Um, so I pitched stories, I would say sort of um, early spring of last year, maybe. But at the same time, we were dealing with, um, you know, uh, the pandemic, and we were doing stories about, you know, uh, ICU nurses and dis disparities in black and brown communities with when with COVID death, then George Floyd died. And then that whole racial reckoning happened. So we kept pushing it off. Finally, we did a piece um, about the series of attacks sort of mid mid year is my recollection. I should actually go back and look. Um, and it wasn't until um, Daniel Day Kim and David Wu came forward and started talking about the Bay Area attacks that we revisited it. Um, and we had done stories about racial disparities with Filipino healthcare workers and how that was disproportionately affecting um, them with COVID. But when that happened, and that was just you know a number of weeks slash months ago, um, I did another story and I was shocked at the number of my white friends who kept saying to me, I had no idea this was happening, Juju. And I was like, but, but, but it's been on my feed for a year. I've been obsessed with this, right? And, and that to me, um, I think got to the second part of I think what we're all reacting to, which is the sheer invisibility of our pain for all of that time. And that that's why we all, I think, feel so strongly that we have to show our pain and exhibit it in a way that brings the humanity. And of course, when I wound up, you know, in front of the um, Asian theme spa in Atlanta reporting on that um, uh, horrible event, it felt like um, a reckoning for, for the Asian American community. Yeah. You know, I think um, I think what's also important for people to understand too is there. With you know, so many people get their information from social media, um, a lot from Instagram and TikTok, and there is an algorithm to what you look at. So a lot of times, people aren't seeing; um, it's not coming through their feed because it's not part of their algorithm, um, and that's why it's so important for mainstream media, um, for you know Juju and Dion and you know Vicky Wynn and all, you know, when the, the view was talking about it, or I, I just did Kelly Clarkson the other day and did a, a couple segments on Asian hate. Like when we get bigger mainstream media to talk about this, it really does make a difference because um, that's not competing with an algorithm anymore. You know, that's that's what we need. We need people in um, in mainstream media to, to, to continue talking about this. Yeah, nothing makes me more proud when someone who is white or black wants to champion a story of an attack on an Asian American or in our community, because that's when we know that we have broken through, that it's not just an Asian American problem, it's a problem for all of us. And I remember, this must have been at least eight, maybe 10 years ago when I was working as a news anchor and reporter in Charlotte, North Carolina, there was an incident where there was a billboard advertising Jap maples. And it was offensive to the Japanese and to many Asian Americans who were there. Granted, it's a smaller community than, say, in the Bay Area. There were a number of reasons why we didn't cover the story, but I remember feeling very unheard. And there's nothing more discouraging knowing that people are not going to advocate for you when there is an issue that is very important to your community. So fast forward to the Bay Area where yes, this has been happening for ages. A law enforcement official even told me one-on-one, -on -one, Dion, this is the Bay Area's dirty little secret. No one would cover it before, but it's become this snowball in Olivia thanks to social media platforms like TikTok and Instagram. These younger people are now sharing videos, their surveillance, their cell phone video everywhere, and they're feeling like they can do it and be empowered to do so for the very first time. And that's just kind of ignited the flames to us being able to tell these stories. So we're all human, um, but when you cover these attacks, um, you mentioned getting emotional. How do you find the strength to continue? I think uh, just for myself, not as a journalist, but just as an artist, as an Asian American, um, it's a sense of responsibility. Um, I know that um, as we were talking about the amplitude of uh, Asian American hate and everyone really speaking out with social media or however they're doing it, there is a sense of responsibility because I feel culturally 
we weren't necessarily allowed to do that. I feel like culturally we've been kind of pushed down so not much to just kind of keep our nose to the grindstones and not make waves that now I feel with this new generation and everything kind of amplifying, we have this sense of responsibility, but I wouldn't necessarily say freedom, lack of a better term, but this angst to want to actually speak out and say something. Dion, you're talking about that really small tidbit about that sign. And I think that culturally has been kind of an issue for us where we kind of just let it slide or let it pass by. Um, there's an incident that happened on my show. It was myself, C.S. Lee, Arden Cho, and a few other Asian American actors about my particular character. And it was our scene. And a Caucasian director comes in and he's really smiling. He comes in and he says, my crazy rich Asians episode. <gasps> and I had to pull him aside and I say, no, we don't do that here. And I pulled him aside and I, and I had a long conversation and he kept reiterating it was a joke and I didn't mean it to be offensive and all this other stuff. And then I made the analogy very similar to what Jay Leno back in the past and Guy Oki had kind of done with kind of the Koreans and eating dogs scenario. I made the analogy of, say it was S.C. Peter Murkison, Marlene Barrett, Yaya Dacosta, series regulars, all black, black African-Americans. And you came in and said, this is my Black Panther episode. Hmm. And it kind of woke him in a particular sense, because there's this thing I feel as far as Asian Americans that I'm also accountable to that we kind of just let stuff slide and people aren't as cognizant to the way that we're being treated and I think that now it's our opportunity and our responsibility to really keep everyone on check and on point. Brian I love what you said because you not only expressed and spoke out but you did an educational piece but in a way that got people to listen and not in a burdening way you know I described it like this um, in a Cronkite uh, news article that I was interviewed for that it's a burden and a blessing at the same time. It's a burden because I feel that tremendous responsibility, but a blessing because now there's the platform and people are paying attention. So it's it's a struggle. And I think it is the blessing part of realizing people trust me as a journalist, what I've always wanted and no longer being pigeonholed as the smiling, happy morning news anchor that was told that you could never do anything more than that. Um, because I remember that very vividly early in my career to now being able to have the privilege of telling people's stories. So that's what keeps me going. You know, hearing Brian, thank you for telling that story because, you know, there are so many stories like that sure. and, um, and they don't get out, um, because, you know, we'll look like the problem. If we decide to tell the story, we're, we're always expected to just handle it within the family, handle it on set, you Correct. know, and, um, and it's interesting. I have found that. Uh, my white co-stars get away with a lot more. Like they get away with so much. And if anything happens to them in the slightest, if they just feel a little bit bothered, they take it to the top. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like this in ingrained um, entitlement that they feel that like that their voice matters. And the thing is like, that's not actually a bad thing. We should all as human beings have the confidence to feel that our voice matters. It's just that we have lived in a world and especially in our industry that has um, supported that idea that white voices and white pain actually matters. And the rest of us have to continue to go along with, with just the, the flow of whatever that, that white flow is and having that white director come in to me, um, when he, when he says like, oh, this is my crazy, you know, crazy rich Asian episode. It's to me, it, it's, it's, a it's so clear why he thinks that way because when the, there's a landscape of white faces and a landscape of, of, of white savior movies and, and white people telling everyone else's stories and everyone who is marginalized or a minority, we get to be the supporting cast. Mm -hmm. When a movie like Crazy Rich Asian comes in, um, people start to think it's a trend the same way that procedurals are a trend or, hey, you know what, last, last season, um, hospital dramas were really big. Let's do a bunch of hospital dramas. Right. Okay, this year, like family dramas are really great. Let's do an another This Is Us. And then they look at Asians, they go, Asians, that was a great trend. Let's, let's, let's do some more Asian stuff. And the thing is that being Asian American is not a trend, Correct. period, full stop. I would um, dovetail off of both of you all too, in that the crazy rich Asians thing is part of the model minority um, 
fallacy that is actually harmful for our community. So while that director was like, oh, it's just a joke, aren't you all crazy rich Asians? The truth is we're not. And that is anytime you're stereotyped, it's, it, it renders invisible those struggling in our community. I, I often say that I helped found a Korean American organization in New York because poverty rates of Asian Americans in the greater New York area rival or exceed African Americans. And yet they are underserved because they are invisible. So there's that. But then we, that model minority myth is often used to uh, pit our quote unquote success against other uh, communities of color, which is incredibly destructive for a lot of different ways. And finally, what I'd say is in terms of the call out, Brian, that was perfect because you didn't shame anyone, but you just sort of educated. And that's a moment. I just have to say, I have three sons who are sports fanatics and we are all talking about Yu Chang. No relation to me, although Clyde did point out that one of my my nephews is a pitcher in the Los Angeles Star. <laughs> oh, you should, all, you should all follow him. His name's Mitchell White, ironically, um, not Chang. But, um, That's exciting. I know, isn't it cool? Wait, who does he who does he play for? For the Dodgers, he was drafted. Nice. Oh my, Dodgers That's your years. nephew. My nephew, Mitchell White. He's at the. Um, alternate site right now in Arizona, but he was in the taxi squad. Okay. Anyway, I digress. I love to brag about yeah, him. You know, we're excited. Asian Mitchell jocks White. go. Yes. Right? <laughs> and A, Asian male jocks go. B, um, you know, Jeremy Lin came out and, and on one of our shows, the one that you were in, Olivia, and he talked about how, you know, they called me Corona. I didn't want to name or blame or shame, but I want to educate. And just like you, Brian, like I want to educate you, like why that's offensive and why that dehumanizes people, right? And so Yu Chang was this pitcher for the Cleveland Indians who made an error, cost the game, you know, whatever. My, like I said, my sons were doing the play-by-play. -play. Um, and it, normally it would have been just like a couple of angry phone calls on the radio station, but instead, he got all sorts of racist hate, right? And right. you know the idea that he was called slanty eyes, tons of words I can't say here, um, in, and also coronavirus, right? And it just goes to show, like I've had so many well-meaning people say to me, well, Juju, why can't you say China virus or Wuhan flu? Because isn't it actually correct? It's from China, it's from Wuhan, why can't you say that? And I've spent the better part of the year saying what I say to my children, which is, words matter and it's not what you say it's how you say it and so when you use it and weaponize it in a way um there is no accident that all of these acts of, that these acts of hate have been perpetrated against asian americans and let's face it in the bay area you know it was a thai grandfather who's never been to china in Ta Texas, it was a Vietnamese family who'd never been to China. Most of the Asian Americans here, most of the Chinese Americans here have never been to China, have nothing to do with China. So this idea that this scapegoating happens to our community is, is so wrong on so many levels, the least of which is that it's, it makes no sense. It is just weaponizing fear at one of the most dangerous times in, in human history. I'm glad we talked about education because that's where I want to go with our next question. Um, Richard is joining us now. Thank you so much for joining us. And I want to get you in looped into the conversation as well. So thank you for being here. Um, how do you think the stop AAPI hate coverage can be done better or perhaps common mistakes that um, you were seeing? You know, uh, we kind of saw how the names were mispronounced um, in the Atlanta incident um, and the AAJA created a pronunciation resource. Um, or are there any other ways that you all feel um, we can better that? Is that for Richard? I'll let Dion go with that. How about that? Oh, oh I'm sorry. I didn't know it was for me. Go, go ahead, Dion. Richard. <laughs> Richard, go ahead. No, go, Dion. I'll follow you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's that education component again, right? Because how many of us have learned about Asian American history in school or have really paid attention to a pronunciation guide? I remember I did a story early on in the pandemic where a woman named Phuc Bui Nguyen, she's Vietnamese, her teacher had said that her name was inappropriate because it sounded like an expletive. Again, it was P-H-U-C-B-U-I, Phuc Bui is how you pronounce it. And he thought it sounded like something else, which, you know, you can connect the dots. And I think it's the education of this is actually a very common name and explaining it in usual news terms. Would that be a story? 
on how to pronounce this woman's name? Probably not. But finding a way, crafting it and, and telling it in a way that makes it uh, you know, relevant and shows the significance of it, that ended up snowballing into all of these Asian Americans from different backgrounds explaining, oh, when the Asiana Airlines flight happened and people, uh, you know, some random guy called in saying that the victims were named We Too Low and Holy Fook, you know, then that turns on the light of, okay, something is wrong. Something is incorrect. We should have doubted this in the, in the first place. Richard? Thank you. Yeah, um, absolutely. I remember those stories. And boy, can you believe that's actually aired uh, in the Bay Area? It's just like, whoa. Um, I would say, you know, it, it, to tell the stories in, uh, about our API communities in intersectional ways and mainstream ways, that we're not always going to be the Asian character in the story, that we are just a, an American story. And then in terms of intersectional, you know, we talk about immigration, show the, the black face, show the Latino face, show the white face, show the API face, all as part of uh, this immigration story that we're living through right now. And I think that's the way that our community exists, both in a mainstream way and as well as in an intersectional way. And that's, that's not easy to do, but it's important to do. I would say that, um it's really about context and um, trying to put into context um, a viral video that shows the conflict, which we all know in television news, you know, that's what you tease with and that's what you go with. But until you put that incident into context, um, it's really hard um, to just keep playing those, you know, the viral videos over and over again. Um, the other thing that I would say, though, is that what we have seen when those videos do go viral is that there has been um, a snowball effect, both good and bad. Um, I was on this conversation last night with the head of the Anti-Defamation League, and he was saying, you know, in the Jewish community, there have been incidents of copycats when there's a lot of, um, you know, publicity like this. But the good, the upside about it is that it creates, you know, what Safan Kim has called the snowball effect in the other way, that when one person reports and Olivia's friend's mom reports and she gets justice, that that too is contagious, that that then inspires the next person to come forward. And, and then there's other activists who are inspired to do, you know, um, uh, sort of language translations on how to report a hate crime. But in our newsroom, we've had a lot of conversations, which I think reflect on what Brian and Olivia do um, in, 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 in the entertainment space, which is that we normalize Asians as humans. Right. So, um, so, you know, we've talked about having experts who are Asian Americans um, more, right? That, 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 that we should have doctors on who are Asian Americans during the coronavirus. That when we go to cover a disaster, we don't just cover white families coming to the rescue or, or, or white saviors, that we cover, you know, uh, people of color in, in all the roles that we cast. So when we see Brian play a doctor in Chicago Med, we're like, oh, that's not an Asian doctor, that's a doctor. That's what Shonda Rhimes once told me when I went to interview her about all of her shows. She's like, you know, um, uh, Grey's Anatomy is not about black doctors. It's a show about great doctors who just happen to be black and they don't really talk about race as much as we think that we, you know, that, that the show might, but it doesn't. And it's only when we, we see Asians in every form, even whether it's broadcast journalism or, or in inter the entertainment space as humans, and not as some caricature, um, that's when we have progress, I should think. Juju, I have to say something on like just a kind of amusing note is that when I moved to the Bay Area, I remember very distinctly an Asian American postal worker walking down the street and I stopped what I was doing and I stared at him. And the reason why is because growing up in places like Michigan and Ohio and Connecticut and then working in Kansas and North Carolina and Florida, I'd never seen one before. So to me, representation that way, um, you know, it, it had such a big impact on me. Imagine if that was in the grand landscape of things. You know, uh, though organizations like Stop uh, AAPI hate, they've reported over 3,700 incidents of anti-Asian acts and crimes in less than a year. We know that these crimes are being underreported. Um, Dion, you uh, have found a unique way to connect uh, with folks, um, the San Francisco Asian American community, um, to get them to come forward. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, and it's to what Juju mentioned with the snowball effect that my colleague Safan Kim in New York City is dealing with, is that on social media, the barriers are broken down because you are hiding behind a computer screen or a phone screen. And just like those trolls who like to fire off something nasty and really inappropriate to you, it's the people who are scared to put their faces out there because I think, Brian, you mentioned it too, that we were, uh, as Asian Americans, so many of us are taught to stay in our lane don't cause trouble. But instead of causing trouble, they're just sharing with me, just one person. And it feels a little bit more intimate and not so scary as going to a police station. Because let me tell you, that's a, a whole other conversation in itself, because a lot of these victims, one, have a language barrier. Two, they don't feel comfortable being asked very invasive questions. Um, their personal phone numbers and you know known associates, things like that. And it's a very challenging process. And one that's quite broken, um, that takes a very long time and Asian Americans and a lot of people feel discouraged not to do it. So the magic, I suppose, um, you know, I've described it as this, is that people feel empowered when they are able to just pick up their phone and send a message like, hey, I remember one that broke my heart, a woman who said, every single member of my family at our donut shop in Oakland has been attacked in the past 20 years. And she said, nobody reported it. And I said, how is that possible? And she said, you can share my story, just don't use my name. And I said, okay, that's fine. Totally don't worry about your name or where the donut shop is, but let me just put it in my Instagram story. And so many people then said, oh my God, that was me too. My parents were also robbed in Oakland and nobody did anything about it. So it's that snowball in effect um, that plays out in just one posting or one story. You know, in terms of that, sorry. Uh, no, I was just gonna add to Dion, what else is very, I feel interesting about the social media, I would say movement is that, you know, for Asian Americans who feel so isolated and alone and particular segments or even culturally, there is a sense of community out there. And that sense of community is vast and large. Like Olivia can post something and literally get someone arrested for doing a hate crime. Thank you, Olivia. Um, but all of you have kind of created this massive movement purely through, I feel, our social media elements for, I guess, smaller communities of Asian descent to be able to speak out, to allow themselves to speak up, to create that particular awareness that this is actually happening to us and it's happening for a very, very long time. I could just add that like, you know, of course we all know it's, we talk about so much about how much negativity there is on social media, but I do believe that people are inherently good. And if you look at social media, the internet it is just a collection of people. And if you go to them and ask them for help and you rally them in the right way, I do believe that they, they step up and do the right thing. And you saw that with my friend's mom. And, um, and so I think it's always, it's really important to also talk about the positive things that are happening. Um, the fact that we do have a sense of community, like Brian said, and like what Dion was saying, and that snowball effect the other way that, you know, if we can just rally it and focus our energies that way, you know, uh, the good does outweigh the bad. Always, always. You know, in terms of speaking up for Asian Americans, especially uh, when culturally we may be um, inhibited to speak up, and I want to talk about the great responsibility that you might feel in representing the Asian American community as a whole, you know, even though we are all from different heritages and backgrounds and cultures. Olivia, you've spoken about saying no to many roles because the characters um, would not be a good representation of women or Asian women. Can you talk about that? Yeah, this is in the, the beginning of my career. And, you know, one, um, there was, you know, the, the, the fact that I'm, um, you know, that I'm Asian American and some people would look at me and say, you're too Asian to play white. And then some people would say, you're too white to play Asian. And then you just be kind of stuck in the middle. And then, um, and then because, you know, I, I am a mixed ethnicity um, that kind of goes into this exotic place. So usually when you're exotic looking, the casting usually goes to, especially if you're Asian, you have like an, there's a Asian, I, what I've learned is like, there's the Lotus Blossom character. And then there's like the dragon lady. And then the dragon lady is like very um, exotic and um, calculating 
and she's a temptress. And then there's the lotus blossom, which is um, the the Asian American or Asian woman who is um, submissive and um, sexually compliant and helpless. And um, and in general, women in general, we have to deal with issues. But um, when you are a minority, they, you know, I'm sure Brian feels this way too. It's like they just go, okay, what? what like one dimensional character can I cast you as? And so it took a long time in the beginning of me having to say no to things because um, I also had to teach my representatives that they're not going to make money on me if you only are engaging in these offers. And it's hard because when you are getting certain offers, only it's almost almost like that only that window opens up, right? Mm -hmm. And so you only get those, like I'm sure Brian's getting a lot of doctor stuff and a lot of, you know, it's like, it just comes through, but you like, I want to be able to play a lot of other things. So you have to um, take a risk and not make money for a while and not elevate your career, not take other opportunities to just even become a, a better known person and to get a, a higher Q rating and to, to get a bigger box office number behind your name because you have to say no, because you don't want to keep perpetuating the same stereotypes. So that happened a lot in the beginning of my career. And I mean, and other things too, like, you know, when I did X-Men, I signed on because I said, I, you know, it was, you know, I'm, you know, the, I wanted to be able to do a big, like they said, well, it's a, it's a small role in the first, we're gonna introduce, introduce your character, but then we're gonna do, it's gonna be the biggest fight scene. And so I worked really, really hard on that. And I remember being on set and um, the director, Brian Singer, just kept wanting me to just play it so um, like the dragon lady, but just be there. You know, I was like, why can't she just, why can't she just be cool? Like, why, why does she have to have this like intensity all of the time? And then I, I also learned on that, um, which Brian can attest to as well, which is like, it only needs one. You just give them one, like, just give me one take. That's all they need is one take to then create, you know, that image of what they see um, an Asian person should look like on screen. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so there's constant battles all the time, but, um, I have found that at least for me, just by saying no and saving my money, my mom is always really big on saving my money. She's like, it's not how much you make, it's how much you save that I have put myself in a position to be able to say no to things so that I can try to create a different career for myself and, um, and add to the landscape of the the movies and tv that i want to see reflected and that i want my my niece to to be inspired by brian any insight on how we can um stop these stereotypes you know the forever foreigner the sort of thing ah uh, yes and everything olivia has has mentioned is is all completely true uh and i can only attest to it and wanting to amplify its its trueness as far as stereotypes and tropes. I've played Asian villains and made a career out of playing Asian villains uh, up until I would say Chicago Med, the show that I'm currently on. And just a little anecdotal situation that happened because I was on a show, a different show that a Korean American wrote and she was the showrunner for it. She created this really wonderful layered character individual the show didn't get picked up it was an nbc show dick will says i want to do a medical drama they get a call from an aapi organization asking them are you going to have any asians in this medical drama quickly grace Wu, asian american and craig robinson who's the head of diversity over at nbc take me from this other show and place me in chicago Med but it took several Asian Americans and another organization for it to actually come to fruition and me being a representation of an Asian American just on television and being a human being. And it took all of these particular elements and I, and I, and I share this story because I feel like we have to somehow move mountains to be able to feel like we're human, to be able to convince people that yes, we actually exist and we're here and these are the people that we are. Um, so the ways that I feel that the industry can change or just as far as my side of the medium can change, I feel like we have to light the fuse at both ends. Mm -hmm. Yes, we absolutely need representation. Just playing normal figures and more faces, the better. The, the, the more that you know, I grew up on television and, and in my, I would say my living room, I, I learned a lot off of it. 
Um, and I think a lot of people do as well. And I feel, I feel the more people that see faces like ourselves on television playing normal, layered human characters, the more understanding we can have for one another, the more relatability we can have for one another. And on the other end of the fuse, I feel like there's blind casting, but on the other end, there's conscious casting. And we also need to be consciously aware of the stories that we're actually telling about Asian Americans, right? They can't be those singular tropes that Olivia just explained as far as X-Men and the quote unquote white version of what an Asian female should act like. It's no, you have to be very conscious of that. And you have to outsource from all of us creatively to be able to consciously create these particular storylines so that when both fuses come together, I feel like we're creating this this, I wouldn't say movement, but this uh, pendulum switch into our own identity, into our own understanding that everyone else can relate to. But if I can expand on that um, idea, Brian, clearly you were ready and you had the chops and you had the experience to then take that opportunity and run with it. And I feel like uh, a sort of parallel thing happened at ABC just this last, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago when the Atlanta shooting happened that Eva Pilgrim and I, you know, Eva Pilgrim is the weekend Good Morning America anchor. She too, like Olivia is uh, half Asian, um, but, but her lived experience was having been raised by a single Korean mom, it, she identifies like Olivia very strongly as an Asian woman. And she and I went to the you know management and said, "This we have to do this in a big way. And uh, within 24 hours, they greenlit uh, an hour in prime time and we were ready, right? I had spent decades covering those mass shootings and decades covering, you know, um, all of, you know, I've done, you know, uh, the, the Asian sex trade workplace, human trafficking, I've done, you know, I, I was ready, right? And so when I went to Atlanta, I was able to humanize um, in an interview with Randy Park, the son of the man, of the woman, who, one of the women who was killed in one of the spas. And, and that gets to Olivia's point about the hypersexualization and the um, stereotyping of Asian American women and the real world impact, because the other woman we had on the show, our hour in prime time um, was Evelyn Yang, who spoke out about rape culture and the hypersexualization of Asian women. Um, and I think that these media representations do have a subconscious impact on unconscious bias against Asian women. Because if you go back and you look at um, the statistics that hashtag, you know, stop AAPI hate, put out, uh, women reported t two to one uh, more than Asian men that they had been attacked. And, and that, that, that sort of flows into what we were talking about, that women are seen either as, Asian women are seen either as submissive or in some way, you know, sex objects, which is, um, you know, disturbing at best. Juju, first off, I have to say, claps for getting that together because I remember getting a call, I think the day before saying, can you contribute to this? And I said, how did you get a, an hour long special together in just a couple days? <laughs> twice, right? Over? I think yes. it's twice. Two yes. hours. Well, the first hour was a streaming hour that Olivia had a beautiful, she was like the heart moment. I've been quoting you, Olivia, from that for, for ever since. Um, she talked about her mother and I'd love for you to reprise that because it was such a, a heartbreaking moment. Um, this idea of accepting second-class citizenship was just so powerful and profound. But we took a lot of the material from that. I interviewed Daniel Day Kim. I interviewed a lot of folks around this issue so that when it came time to, to get a primetime hour greenlit, and again, this is the mainstream audience who we want to call this attention to, we had that material ready. We had the experts ready to go. I had been talking to Evelyn Yang for months. So it all just kind of overnight success in 30 years in the making, guys. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And can I also just say real quickly too, is that don't sell yourself short because early in my career and maybe Olivia and Brian, I don't know if you felt this way too. I felt like I just needed to play into the stereotype a little bit of being the trippy morning anchor who always had very colorful um, clothes and wanted to smile all the time because I then would say, oh, I'm just here because I'm Asian and I had to fill a quota because it was just easier for me to do that. And I think if had I realized that I had value very early on in my career or that I have the value and the power that I have now to get a message across and to speak for a community, I would not have behaved that way and I would have probably been much more successful in getting the message across. Yeah, I think also, 
Yeah, oh, go for go it. Ahead, okay. No, Richard, you're you're late to the game. You come in. I've said I'm always before. late. All right. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> Olivia, I, I and and what you said as well, Dion and Juju is, you know, I felt like when I first joined CNN, I would only pitch an Asian American story once every two years. Mm-hmm. Like I have this thing in my brain because I said I didn't want to be the Asian guy pitching Asian stories. I just didn't want to be pigeonholed. And now we're in this great time where we can stand up and we can say, I look this way and I want to pitch a story this way and you need to take it. And Juju, you brought up a good example of that. And Olivia and Brian too, and, the, and Dion, that you can now and we can and we should do more of this. I am Asian American, I want this. And it's because I'm Asian American. And we, we can say that. This is a different time and we should take advantage of it. In terms of the perennial foreigner very quickly is to share our immigration stories. We have always walked away from that as a community because we're scared of being seen as the perennial foreigner if we share our immigration stories. No, we should share them. Like Olivia was brought up, Juju, you brought up uh, Olivia sharing her story with you and her family on on your show. We got to keep on doing that because people will start to understand the nuances of what that is instead of running the other way, which culturally we typically do. Sorry, Olivia. Oh, no. Five minutes. I'm sorry. We've got about five minutes left. So I just want to make uh, make sure that we get in just the last few things. We want to talk about solutions. You know, even though we're all talking about stop the hate, some of the attacks were, are getting worse and escalating, and it is frustrating and heartbreaking. How do you think that we can stop this? Richard? Um, how do we stop this? Well, I wish you would, you would go with somebody else first on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the way we stop it is the way I actually started uh, when I joined late. And thanks again for having me, which is that we we need to continue to express this in intersectional ways. And all of us, I think, have an opportunity now to reach out to other communities of color and be an ally as APIs. I think we're we're in a time where we're early on in our stages of development as a community of color and understanding the, the power that we might have, the voice that we might have, the obligation that we might have. And by the way that we'll learn those best practices is by becoming allies with other communities of color, not because we're against the world, but because we need to learn how to express who we are. And how can reporters and actors come together and help? I think we've been doing it. I think that, yeah. you know, we've, uh, we've all been like, even moments like this, when we get to, you know, talk with each other and talk it out, but also, you know, we are united in, in, in the same cause, which is, you know, creating a more inclusive world for everyone and making sure that AAPI are not lost in that because we are so often lost when it comes to talking about inclusivity and diversity in Hollywood, um, a lot of times AAPI are not considered and, um, or, you know, and also I think it's important that we, we continue to talk about this and we continue to, to um, expect more from our producers and our studio heads. And we put more people in positions of power who, who look like us, you know, Grace Wu, when Brian brought her up, I love Grace so much. You know, I, I went and auditioned for Grace during a time when I was so used to everyone seeing me, like I, how I had said earlier. And, um, and I went in for a really big audition and I thought, I'm just going to go in and do this for fun. I was at that place in my, you know, when Brian, you know, like, I'm just going to go in and just have fun with it. Whatever, I'm not going right. to get it. <laughs> yeah. <'cause, laughs> and I remember walking in and seeing Grace and seeing that she looks like my family and seeing that she looked at me as just an actress, mm-hmm. like, let's see what you got. And, um, we developed such a great friendship from that. And, um, and she cast me and it was one of those moments where I thought, oh, wow, like there's somebody on the other side in a power position that isn't trying to put me into a box. So if we want to rip out the disease roots of this infrastructure, then we need to also look at the top first and start to replace um, really um, important positions with more um, people who look like us. Um, I would absolutely echo what Olivia is saying. I think uh, representation in upper echelons of management is a key ask right now um, because 
that kind of power and that kind of sponsorship can translate. Um, other things that I've heard that are really make a lot of sense when I've talked to activists in Chinatown, for example, they said, come shop, come have dinner. Like the, we're dying here because people are afraid of coronavirus and they're afraid of Asian communities. Um, that was another big, big eye-opening moment. And I think, you know, racial solidarity, as Richard was saying, is the key to moving forward. And I've done so many stories last night, you know, the head of the NAACP was in the same conversation and he said, I was so impressed with you guys, you Asian American community members, because you were, you, you were a friend before you needed a friend. And a year ago when George Floyd um, was killed and we were out on the streets, the Asian American community came to our side and marched alongside us and talked about racial reckoning and racial equity. And now it's time for us to do the uh, reverse, which I thought was so um, meaningful. And I feel like we have done that. I've covered um, the, the, the bridge building in the Los Angeles community between the Korean American community, for example, and the African American community post the 1992 uprising following the Rodney King verdict. There's so much to move forward. But one of the other things I would say is, is, is em as immigrants and, and with that experience, I think we, are, we have an affinity to the Latino community as well, especially in areas like voting rights, where the Asian equivalent to the NAACP and the Hispanic caucus has been working for decades in New York to get um, translated ballots, access to voting, um, the kinds of things that actually made a difference in Georgia um, in that Senate runoff. So those are areas in which we can partner um, and, and work together in coalitions. One quick thing, and I'm sorry, I'm, uh, is that we got to be more uncomfortable and like it. All of us have been uncomfortable in this latest year, but the discomfort works. Like the conversations that have been breached by all of you and, and huge kudos for doing it in all of your spaces of influence, that being uncomfortable is good for us because it's, it's stretching us right now. Yeah, just keep the conversation going, sweet and simple. You don't have to go out and beat your chest and start a rally and a movement, but the little things, the little conversations that you have on a day-to-day -day basis, they are making a difference. Well, that's a wrap and I wanna thank everyone for participating. This was wonderful and I'm honored to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. you thank you for having us. Thank you. What a thank fabulous, you, so you guys, it was a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous conversation. I really, I want to say thank you. I was taken by, it's time to stop weaponizing fear. And I think that's absolutely true. And I think education is the key and communication and being uncomfortable and pushing and pushing and pushing the envelope and accepting no less. So thank you. It was really inspiring to be able to be with you. I want to say this is our time to stop. Um, and we are going to, um, move into a breakout rooms uh, discussions now that will be moderated by Mary Cavallero, who's our SAG-AFTRA Chief Broadcast Officer, and Helen Wong, who is our Interim National Director for Equity and Inclusion. This is the beginning. This is, I, we call this Stop the Hate Week. It's really Stop the Hate Period, all right? It's just a moment that we did it today and we'll continue doing it. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll go into the breakout rooms. Gabrielle, before you do it, I yeah. want to shout out to Grace Wu, who was our PA on All American Girl way oh. back in 93, 94. Wow. She was terrific then, hard worker, open eye. Well done. We love Grace Wu. Absolutely. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. This was really wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.